Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired Microsoft Operating Systems Engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. My channel just hit 100,000 subscribers and I'm taking you behind the scenes to celebrate. We'll check out the shop, my home lab, the network infrastructure, the RAID cages, racks and NASes all interconnected by 10 gigabit fiber, followed by a little stop in my personal computer museum and retro arcade. So join me today as I open the kimono and show you the hardware that I'm most proud of. By now, if you're a regular viewer, you're used to this view of me from the workbench camera. Let's step back for a second and give you a broader view of the shop. As you may know, I'm one of the original authors of Windows NT, XP 2000 and so on, and thus as we go through the house in my shop today, you're likely going to have one nagging question if I don't address it right off the top, and that is, what the heck is one of the Windows developers doing with so much Mac hardware? Well, it started like this. I've always had an appreciation for Apple's industrial design, at, at least for the stuff they make in aluminum. For the last 10 years or so, I've been running a MacBook Pro as my primary laptop simply because I love the hardware, the new single Thunderbolt cable that carries power, video, USB, Ethernet, the crisp display, the fast SSD, even the keyboard on most models. The competitors are catching up, but even so, Apple makes a great laptop. Too bad it's a Mac. But x86 Bootcamp fixes that and on goes Windows 10. I bought the last Intel MacBook Pro completely maxed with the 5600M and 64GB and every other option which makes me either a chump or a genius. At some point, a couple of years ago, I wanted to make a video, and by now I don't even recall what it was, but it was likely a home video of some kind, kids or pets or who knows what. The problem was that I couldn't find Movie Maker. I thought it used to come with Windows or was easily available as a free download, that sort of thing. Try as I might, however, it seemed that Movie Maker was no longer available and no longer supported. And sure enough, it appears that Microsoft pulled the plug on it back in about 2017. Not finding what I needed, I realized that I could merely boot the MacBook up in Apple mode and do my work in their free iMovie app, so that's precisely what I did. Now, iMovie isn't super powerful in terms of complex features, but it did the basics of what I needed it to do, just like Movie Maker likely would have. I eventually moved on to Final Cut Pro 10, and from there I never looked back when it came to video work. Since I was an iPhone user anyway, I quickly got drawn into the ecosystem that is iMessage and iPhoto and so on. I can see why Apple so jealously guards iMessage on the desktop, as it truly is one of those features that's hard to give up once you've become accustomed to having it. That all said, I go back and forth between Windows and Mac all day long. My primary workstation centers around a Dell 38-inch curved widescreen. This particular model has multiple inputs, but better yet, it can switch between a USB-C Thunderbolt input and an HDMI USB input. So I have the PC connected via HDMI and the Mac connected via video over USB-C and I can switch between them with a favorites button on the front panel of the monitor, no extra hardware required. And because the monitor also acts as the KVM, or keyboard and video switch, it automatically reconnects my keyboard to whichever computer I've selected, be it Mac or Windows. It also switches the USB ports on the monitor between the two, and I take advantage of that by also having a 10 port USB 3.2 hub plugged into the back of the monitor, which becomes active and bound to whichever computer is currently using the display. This hub includes a sound adapter, a webcam, and a wireless mouse receiver. When I switch to one or the other, for example, the external sound adapter and numerous other devices are automatically activated on the active computer, whichever one it is. That way, devices like my mouse and the studio mic here and the webcam follow me. I was afraid that all these devices continually loading and unloading would cause some kind of issue, but I haven't had a single kernel panic or blue screen yet on either machine, so all is well. As you've likely surmised by now then, the two main computers connected to this monitor are a PC running Windows and an M1 Mac Mini running Mac OS. The M1 just replaced my old trash can 2013 Mac Pro that I've been using for a couple of years. 
Overall, the 6-core Xeon was about equivalent to the 4-core M1 for multi-core CPU work, but the M1 was definitely snappier in single-core day-to-day use, particularly editing in Final Cut, and that's when I made that switch. The two downsides were A, the loss of my external GPU, and B, the shortage of Thunderbolt ports on the Mac Mini. There's only two. There's not a lot I can do about the GPU issue. Unless and until Apple supports external GPUs on their custom silicon, which might never happen, it sits idly by in the cupboard below the desk. For the Thunderbolt shortage, however, I'm running a pair of 3-to-1 Thunderbolt hubs from OWC. A lot of people on YouTube are recommending them for Thunderbolt 3 systems, but I should be clear that I was only able to get these hubs to work on my new Mac Mini, which is Thunderbolt 4. On my old MacBook Pro and my Mac Pro, the new hubs did nothing. On the Mini, though, they split my original two ports into a six full Thunderbolt 4 ports, giving me the same number of ports as I had on the old Mac Pro, and more than enough to connect all of my peripherals. While the GPU isn't of any use, I have two other major components that are essential a RAID cage, and a 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter. The Ethernet adapter is largely self-explanatory. It gives me a 10 gigabit connection to the Windows PC, the NAS, and selected locations in the house such as my office, my sofa, and the kids' computer lab. The big use cases are live editing 4K video off the NAS and moving around those huge files once they're ready. Everything else remains at 1 gigabit except for a few choice routes. The RAID cage is little more than a dual-slot PCIe cage with two Samsung 6.4TB SSD cards and a power supply. I configured the two cards to run in RAID 0, meaning it both reads and writes both to and from the SSDs in parallel, thus doubling the speed. That allows me to read and write at about 2500MB a second to and from the drive, and better yet, they are enterprise parts that can sustain those speeds, giving me large and snappy drives to do video editing on. I built this Windows PC last year, and as I often do, I went with the second best that money could buy. That's often where the sweet spot for price performance is. At the time, that meant the AMD Threadripper 3970X. That gave me 32 cores for about $2,000, versus having to double the price again to $4,000 if I wanted the 64 cores of the 3990. Since I just didn't think I could make use of them, at least not enough to justify their cost, I stuck with the 32 core edition. Next, I added 10 RGB fans, but with a twist. Rather than run the LEDs in parallel, as most everyone does and most controllers require, I wired their data lines in series, cascading from one fan to the next all the way around. Then I wrote code for the ESP32 microcontroller that would convert XY positions to radial fan positions so I could draw onto them like a canvas. And then I wrote a number of facts to take advantage of how the fans are wired. Let's have a quick look at some of the effects that the fans can perform. If you're interested, sub to the channel for the full build info. Even though these fans are inexpensive and there are quite a lot of them, they're still pretty quiet. So quiet, in fact, that I record every episode with the mic pointed basically right at them, only a few feet away from the PC. Right now, I'm actually interpolating video so the CPU is fully engaged and you can hear it, but it's not outrageous. Because the fans are large and numerous, however, they can run at a very low speed and still move the volume of air required to cool the big Threadripper. The other feature of the big PCXL case, besides its ability to hold this giant motherboard, is its ability to swallow up the huge Noctua NH14 cooler, which is extremely tall and couldn't fit any other case that I could easily find. That allowed me to go the reliable air cooling route. I doubled up the fan capacity by putting on both a pusher and a puller on opposite sides for even more capacity, and I've never had an issue under even sustained and continuous loads. I had the big Gigabyte Aorus liquid cooler on hand just in case, but when I didn't need it, I threw it on an old i477K that I had on hand. Within a couple of weeks, the pump was growling away loudly, reaffirming my belief that water cooling is awesome right up until the pump fails or the coolant develops some new Ebola-based superinfection. I decided to get three of the fastest new 2TB SSDs that I could find, the Gigabyte PCI-4s, and arrange them in RAID 0, which is striped. I had some reliability issues with them installed directly in the motherboard, so instead I loaded those three SSDs plus an Optane 905 stick onto the 4x4 PCI SSD card that comes with the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme TRX40 motherboard. That puts all four SSDs on the same branch of the PCI tree rather than scattering them around the bus, and that has been rock solid ever since I made that change. Since I use Synology Active Backup, and it can only back up basic disks and not dynamic disks, 
I couldn't create a true RAID set using the disk management tool. Instead, I created a two-way mirror using Windows 10's new storage spaces feature and I'm happy to report that it's been working perfectly as well. I even get more than 10,000 megabytes a second or 10 gigabytes a second of throughput, which is essential for me when moving around large 4K video files from the channel. And speaking of Synology NASes, I actually have two. I started with a single unit, a DS2419 Plus that comes with 12 bays and can be later expanded to 24. Once I had it up and running and configured, I remembered that the very important fact that RAID is not a backup. To fix that, I added a second Synology DS2419 out here in the shop, which is of course a different physical building. One backs up to the other nightly so that my data is never stored in only a single place. Due to bug in the Linux network driver for the Aquantia 10 gigabit chip, however, or maybe it's in the firmware, I fought with data corruption when making a backup for literally months as well. But with an Intel NIC, it's all backing up reliably now. As we head into the house to check out those workstations and the network infrastructure, say hello to Callie the shop dog. Callie is a miniature American Shepherd and the first thing I train any of my shop dogs is to run to their bed on command so that if something gets dropped or spilt, I can tell them to do so for safety. Let's head on into the house. When I'm working in the house, I'll generally be in one of two places. I might be in the Oval Office. It contains the same 38-inch Dell monitor as out in the shop but connected to a single PC. This desktop is actually an old i7-4770K proving that as long as a piece of hardware still does its job efficiently and effectively, it's never truly obsolete. And speaking of old hardware, let's take a stop in my computer museum which retraces some of the oldest hardware that I initially learned on like the TRS-80, the PET, the C64, the Amiga and more. The Amiga 500 and the Commodore 64 mark the beginning of my commercial aspirations. In the Amiga case, it was Hypercache and for the 64, I wrote a game called Tour de Force. Off in the corner, you might see a VT220 and a rotary dial phone. Here's my 4K PET 2001 and the couple of dual gang disk drives that I have. There's my Ship It Plax and a TRS-80 Model 1 Level 1 4K. Now with an expansion unit, bring it up to 48K. Also with an Ethernet port so I can put it up as an FTP site. Here's a nice touch that every Oval Office really ought to have. A stone panic room beneath your Oval Office protected by a thick door and a hidden staircase behind a moving bookshelf. This is the room that I'm fortunate to call my home office. As you can see, it's the Oval Office for its obvious shape and uh, that makes some of the carpentry rather challenging. We'll take a look behind some of that carpentry as we zoom down behind the bookshelf and take a look at the bunker below the office itself. In addition to the standard bar and pool table, we have a wine cellar which contains no wine because it contains my arcade machines. The arcade machines, as you can see, would be challenging to move down into this room. They actually get dropped in from above. This is my Black Knight 2000 which I bought out of a bar in Germany on eBay and then hand restored. The back glass was actually in nice shape so I was fortunate there. The Tempest machine is an original. I actually received it as a bonus for completing a milestone early when I was coding on the C64 back in the mid 80s so I've had it almost since new. Tempest was made in three sizes or form factors. The upright version that you see here, a cocktail table which I have in my office and an in-between cabaret version out in the shop. Not only is it my favorite game but it's also notoriously bad to play on an emulator. I've actually held the world's high score on Tempest for about 40 years off and on now. Let's take a look at some last level advanced Tempest gameplay. When I went to start practicing to set the world record on Tempest, I just threw on my robe and grabbed a mug and set up a video camera to monitor myself. I set the record in my first attempt, so if you actually watch the video, which is not this video, but the video of me setting the record, you'll notice that yeah, I'm wearing a robe and holding a cup of coffee and I look completely unprepared, and that's why. Back in the shop, I'm in the midst of setting up an interview area where I hope to conduct tire table talk. My first goal is to do the MS-DOS Masters series, bringing in some of the original developers back from the MS-DOS days to get their takes on the PC world then and now. If you have a guest you'd like to see me interview and keep it realistic unless you're a relative of course, let me know in the comments. Upstairs, if I'm not working in the Oval Office, I'm probably over at the Media Room sofa. Here's where the magic of Thunderbolt really shines as a single cable brings me 100 watts of power. 10 gigabit Ethernet, 4K video, and PCIe access to a RAID array hidden out of sight. A CalDigit TS3 dock sits right behind the sofa and allows me to plug in backup drives, SD cards, and various other peripherals. The focal point of family life in this house is the craft room where Mum's office overlooks a small lab of four computers, two of which are iMacs. 
The other two are Apple Cinema Display monitors connected to PCs hidden away in cabinets just so that everything looks consistent. Once we dive a little deeper into the household infrastructure, we discover that there are racks for each purpose. There is a rack for phone, a rack for data, one for video, one for audio, one for security, and so on. There are really four main racks, and they are distributed within the home geographically to be close to whatever purpose they are serving. One thing you may notice is that I did absolutely zero additional cable management getting ready to film this, and it's just because I hit the milestone and wanted to make the video, so I didn't run around the house tidying up every cable closet, which I probably should have before filming it for posterity, but I did not. The top of the data rack is a unified Dream Machine Pro, which has a 1 gigabit connection to the cable service, and it has a 10 gigabit connection to the aggregation switch. In between them is a PoE switch which runs some security which that runs in parallel to the uh, normal security system. I'm trying out some Unify stuff and it also has PoE for all the Wi-Fi. Speaking of Wi-Fi, once we get past the data and phone patch panels here, we'll see a Unify setup on a Razer laptop so that I can monitor my Wi-Fi. Once we get past the Wi-Fi monitoring station, we'll drop down and see the Synology NAS. At any point, I typically have about 100 clients on the network, 60 of which are wireless. The NAS itself has 12 bays, it's populated out to about 100 terabytes, and it has a twin out in the shop so that one backs up to the other with history. It also takes the time machine backups from every machine that's a Mac overnight, and it runs active backup from Synology to back up all the Windows clients. The video rack is a little forlorn these days because everything is pretty much just moved to an Apple TV right connected to the TVs themselves. I've standardized on the Onkyo 929 in all the rooms that have surround sound. At the entry to each of the buildings on the property, there's generally a data and a security patch panel that provides connections back to the main building. This is but one example. There are two security systems. Here's the older of the two, a Bosch 7412G. There's over a hundred zones, so everything is commercial. Speaking of commercial, look at my IBM disk pack. Nah, that's my pool heater. Now that you've seen my hardware setup, the next obvious question is, what do I do with it all? Well, the last six months have been largely in pursuit of growth of this channel, but before that, it was all for LED software development. The entire shop is pretty much lit by LEDs at this point. I also use the system to power my all-year-round Christmas lights. Here's a demo of them running on a warm July evening. The system revolves around the ESP32 microcontroller. That chip supports Wi-Fi natively, and what I've done is written a server application that runs on the PC, Mac, or Linux, or even a Docker container inside of a Pi. It generates a color show for thousands of LEDs installed here in the shop and outside on the house. Each block of about a thousand LEDs has its own controller chip, and the server smartly divides up the work, timestamps it, and sends it off to those individual controllers via Wi-Fi. The controllers in the server both sync their time to SNTP to the server NAS so that they have a consistent view and the resultant show is perfectly synced across all of the LEDs. The last LED feature we'll take a look at today are the sequential LED taillights that I built and programmed for my 1970 GMC Sierra Grande pickup. These trucks have tiny dim brake lights and no headrests. Just a recipe for whiplash and they were bonking your head into the back window like my father did in his. So in pursuit of not being rear-ended in the truck that I painstakingly built here in the shop by hand, I used the ESP32 again to add these otherwise hidden LED signals. Let's have a look. Just having amber signals I think helps a lot, but the brightness and the intensity and the animation I think draws a lot of attention to it. It also gives you a clear indication of which way the truck is going to turn, so I think it's a pretty effective mechanism for indicating. The brake incorporates both a strobe and an expansion feature, and I've added a third brake light up on the cab by putting in a red LED inside of the bed light. When the hazards are active, everything gets animated. The ESP32 controller is integrated in by plugging into the trailer socket, which gives me access to left, right, stop, and backup. You can actually get away with just a simple trailer connection and a bit of logic. And for those of you that happen to be police officers, you can turn on the secret police mode. It requires a separate switch, so I don't accidentally activate it, of course. But it looks pretty handy, I think, and if you had a police pickup, it would be a nice feature to add. If you are intrigued by the channel but don't know where to start, I'm going to suggest two videos. The first is on the channel homepage, and that is the secret history of Task Manager. As original author of Task Manager, I sat down one day and kind of documented what the heck I remembered of writing Task Manager, and that kind of evolved into a short video series. Three videos, including source code of Task Manager, that 
yeah, Microsoft was gracious enough to let me actually use, so you might want to check that out. And the other one is the secret history of blue screens, which is why are blue screens blue? There is a reason why blue screens are blue. Not a good one, but it's an interesting story as to how I got there, so check it out. And of course, a few thanks are in order. First of all, thanks to my wife and kids for putting up with my nonsense as previewers and sometimes captive audiences for some of my stuff. And of course, to Glenn, the moderator for the live streams, and he also does all of the uh, vetting of the material generally before I publish it. So he takes a look at it and looks for obvious bugs and boneheaded mistakes that I may have overlooked. And of course, thanks to everybody who has subscribed to the channel. I say that I'm just in it for the subs and likes, and that is largely true. It's how I measure progress against my goal, and my goal was this time to get to 100,000 subscribers. Initially, my target was 1,000, and then 10,000, and then finally 100,000. I don't think that there's room for a million Dave PL subscribers, so maybe 200,000 at some point? We'll see how it goes. For now, I'm content. I'm going to continue making content, and I hope you enjoy it. If you're not subscribed to the channel yet, could I make it any plainer that it matters to me, so please do so. <laughs> and of course, don't forget to get your classic Dave's Garage Mug. Available from the link in the video description with all proceeds going to autism research and support services. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Stay tuned for some outtakes. It sights, uh, it sights, it sights, I say bye. And here's a nice touch. Here's a nice touch. What? Don't don't lose. <laughs> Didn't sound right at all. The emphasis on the wrong syllables. Uh, if one I spoke French, this wouldn't be a problem. Instead, I created a two-way mirror using Windows 10's Windows 10. Since I use Synology Active Backup, it can only backup act. As you, <laughs> yeah, tip your head. That's smart.